All right, in this video, I want to talk about tradition versus God's word. But I'm looking at things a little bit differently. You know, I've talked about this before, and I've talked about this chapter before. But when I was reading it this morning, I was able to see something different. And it comes from mainly the first paragraph right here. So I'm going to read a bit of that to show you where I'm coming from and how this opened up. It starts off by saying, Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain other scribes, which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they, ha they have received to hold as washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Now, you may just be thinking, oh yeah, the Pharisees, they have a tradition. The disciples weren't following it. They're saying, Jesus, hey, why aren't your disciples following this tradition? Right? Because Jesus did say that the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, whatever they say, do. Right? But they're not doing that. Right? And he makes it seem as though this is a doctrine and commandment of men, and it's it's making void the commandment of God, the word of God, right? If you read the rest of the context of the conversation that ends uh, at about verse 13 here, right? So what's the big deal about washing their hands before they come and eat? What's the big deal about washing the dishes? And what helped is that before I read this, obviously I read Mark chapter 6. All right, usually that's what you do. You read it in order. And before we come to chapter 7, there's this right here. A miracle where Jesus feeds thousands of people with some loaves of bread and some fishes, right? I'm going to talk about that. But when Jesus comes to meet them on the water, he's walking out on the sea, it says that they were amazed here. That's where read verses 51 through 52. This is what got me thinking about the whole thing. It says here, and he went up onto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. So they weren't thinking about that miracle. They didn't seem to comprehend it. Mainly because they seemed to just be like, whatever about it. Kind of like Israel, they were being fed with manna. And they were just kind of like, meh, right? There's all kinds of miracles going on. And they just kind of were like, hey, we should have stayed in Egypt. And it's like, do you not realize God himself pulled you out and you're walking with God? And you see, that's what's going on here with this feeding of the, the multitude. These people, men, women, and children, sometimes it's entire families, right? They're following Jesus. They're not eating. They're not drinking unless they have anything on them. A lot of these people, the poor, like the rich, they weren't following Jesus. The educated weren't really following Jesus. Yes, there were some, but generally they weren't, right? The average everyday middle class. Yeah, maybe a few more of those, but I imagine some of them 
weren't following him, but the poor, a good chunk of the poor were following him. But he wasn't there leading them with breadcrumbs out there, giving them a little bit of food to follow him out there. No, he was just giving him his word. He was preaching to them. He was teaching them, right? And as we can see, this is also talked about in John chapter 6. You can go check out that chapter because that's exactly what's going on in that chapter. Jesus is feeding the people his word, right? That's why they're following him. They, they're, they want his word. And since they want his word, he's like, hey, let's feed them. These people come after me. They want me. They want my word. Let's feed them. And they're like, but we don't have anything. Just tell them to go out into the, the villages and buy bread. He's like, no, no, no. We'll do it. And he just has some loaves of bread and some fish. And he multiplies it and feeds thousands of people. At this instance, I'm not sure if this is the 5,000 or the 7,000. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure if it mentions if the actual number in this one. But uh, anyway, when you read the one in uh, John 6, which is which this is saying it's in reference to, uh, there was 5,000 people there, uh, 5,000 men. And that's, it says, not including women and children. So there was even more than that. So uh, the people came looking for Jesus, wanting his word, eating up his word. He fed them with physical food, right? But when you look at John 6 here, let's jump over to that. He feeds them. Then he crosses the Galilee, like we read about him going out to the ship. Right? Then people start following him on the other side of the Galilee. And he says to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat the loaves and were filled. And then he tells them this, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, which would be bread and wine, but for that Meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So you see, they wanted actual physical bread. And when they came looking for physical bread, did he give them physical bread? No. When they came looking for him, for his word, what did he do? He took care of them. But when they came to him looking to be taken care of, all he did was give them his word. So they start asking him things like, hey, what shall we do to do the work of God? And he says, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. He tells them, the will of the Father, one that sent him, is to believe on him. Right? That's what the people were doing before he fed them. Right? As he goes on to say, Verily, verily, I say on to you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. So you see, he's talking about you believing on him. You're believing his words. You're eating his words. You're to live by every word of God, not by bread alone. Right? So when he starts saying, oh, whoever eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood, I will raise him up at the last day. He has eternal life. You can see that he's talking about his words, the people who were eating him up because he was giving him his, their, his word. They were eating it up. But as soon as they came looking for actual bread, it's like, no, I'm not here to just give you your earthly, fleshly desires. Right? He's like, you don't care about me. You care about yourself. Right? You, you, people don't seem to realize that God has feelings. It's kind of like we think he's some kind of robotic wish machine. Right? And that's how a lot of people treat him. Like, hey, give us what we need here. And that's usually when they talk to him. Hey, we need something from you. Right? And you notice how that's uh, how women see men a lot? Like, they don't think we have emotions. Like, we're just buffoons. And we're there just to supply them with attention and money when they need it, when they want it. But they don't 
care about us the way that we care about them. Right? That's kind of what God is doing here. He's saying, hey, you 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 just want for yourself. You you don't care about me. You care about what I can provide for you. So he's not providing for them. And that's why they're like, hey, why aren't you giving us this bread? What do you mean, eat you? You're the food? And he explains to them, like I've done in many videos. He says, the spirit quickeneth, as in it brings to life, fills full of life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak on you, they are spirit and they are life. See, his words are the spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. And that's when his disciples left because they weren't getting actual physical bread. They wanted physical bread and they weren't getting it. So they left and they became Catholics where they can get the bread and the wine, right? And when he asked the other disciples if they were going to leave, the 12, what does Peter say? He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. So, you know, when Jesus is saying, hey, my words are spirit and life, but there's some of you that believe not. That's the bread of life. And Simon, Peter, the supposed first pope of the Catholic Church, says, hey, Jesus has the words of eternal life. And we believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. But they didn't believe. They just wanted something from him. Such as food. Right? You may be saying, what what is this all gotta do with what's going on here in Mark? Where they're talking about washing your hands before you eat and washing the dishes. It's like, well, don't you know the traditions of Christians? There's a tradition of man that says you have to cleanse yourself before you can come to Jesus. That you have to Repent of all your sins before you can come to Jesus. You see, the food they're eating, bread, is representing what he just fed the people with, which was with his word. They didn't have to cleanse themselves before they came to Jesus to eat. And the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leadership of Christianity today, say you have to cleanse yourself before you can come eat the word of God, before you can come to Jesus. And believe. So they talk about washing of the cups and the, the vessels. This is an example of yourself. Your body is a vessel. And they act like, oh, you have to cleanse yourself before you can come to God. Right? So that's what Jesus is actually getting on him about. Because there's what there's nothing wrong with washing your hands before you eat or washing the dishes. But you see how Jesus spoke to them in parables. So he, they didn't realize what he was telling them. And I'll show you momentarily that this is exactly what he talks to them about. Uh, the same Pharisees and scribes in uh, another passage. And he talks about washing. And that's why he acts as though this is a tradition of men. And it makes void the word of God. Because it does. This belief that you don't come to Jesus as you are. You have to cleanse yourself. That's not true because you can't cleanse yourself. You need to come to Jesus so that he can cleanse you, right? And that's where I come over here. Excuse me. At Matthew 23, and just for context, I'm going to go up here to let you know uh, that Jesus is talking about the scribes and the Pharisees. And then he's, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Uh, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. So he's he's talking to the scribes and Pharisees this whole chapter. Uh, even this passage here right before it, you scribes and Pharisees. And the passage I have highlighted, you scribes and Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees, right? So he's talking to the same group that he's talking to here in Mark chapter 7, right? What does he tell them here? He says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter. So you see what he means by their tradition. Right? He's using that as a parable, as a metaphor, to teach him about the same thing he's telling him here. 
You clean the outside, but within they are full of extortion and excess. So you see, there's not extortion and excess inside of a cup or a platter or a bowl. No, you see the cup, the platter, the dishes represent you. He's saying you cleanse the outside, but inside you're evil. And it doesn't matter you clean the outside of the cup. Oh, you appear righteous, right? You appear clean to people, but inside you're not. And that's what he really gets into as he goes on to say, Now blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. So he's talking about being born again, where the soul is born again and you become one spirit with the Lord. For 1 Corinthians 6.17, those who are joined out of the Lord become one spirit. Right? So the inside, the flesh doesn't become one with God. The soul does. And eventually we'll have one flesh with the Lord because we gave him our flesh so that he died in our place. He's going to give us his flesh. So our vile body is going to be replaced by his glorious body like we read at the end of uh, Philippians chapter 3. You know what? Since I brought it up, I'll just show you because sometimes people... They don't they don't go look for themselves and they're like oh you just make things up and that's why I I have the word of God here you're not seeing my ugly mug up here you're seeing the word of God because you can argue with him because that's what I'm sharing here what we see here uh, verse 20 and 21 of Philippians chapter 3 says for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So you see, at the cross, by faith, you give Jesus your vile body. You become one flesh with him so that he dies for you. This body that you have died on the cross 2,000 years ago. You're just living out the whole life that Jesus died for. And then once you die, in the flesh or Jesus comes back he's going to take the soul away from this body and you're going to be given a glorious body that's fashioned like onto his glorious body so you got to clean the inside the soul that the outside may be cleansed also but you see that's how a lot of Christians are aren't they you put on an outward show where you're judged by the law you're judged by a certain denominations rules and canon law and what have you so if you're outwardly following their rules you're righteous but you're not because inside you don't want to really obey god you want to sin you're a pharisee right you have an outward appearance of righteousness you're not born again you're just covering it up Right? But you see, they're blind. Like he keeps calling them blind here. And you could understand they're spiritually blind to what they're really doing. They think they're good, godly people. And the people who aren't being like them are evil, ungodly people. And it goes, he goes on to say at verse 27 Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which is like a tomb, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So you see here how, coming back over to Mark 7, how this has all kinds of meaning to it. It's not just about washing your hands and washing the dishes. You see, this is about coming to God as you are. And it's about allowing God to cleanse you from the inside out. Right? You don't cleanse the outside of yourself and then come to God. Right? You come to him as you are, and he cleans you from the inside out. And you see how that has to do with some kind of intimacy. You have to let God in. And you have to be honest with God. And sometimes that comes down to you telling God the truth. You know what, God? I don't like that you're God and I'm not. You get to make the rules and I don't. I don't like it. Right? 
if you're being honest, you know that's how it is. You know it. I want to go do what I want to do, and I don't think it's fair that I don't get to do what I'm going to do. And if I go do what I got to do, want to do, there's consequences to it, and I just don't like it. Right? If we're being honest, that's how it is, right? I want to be able to do these things that I desire to do. I don't want to have to fight myself and have to control myself because the things I want to do are selfish and pleasure-seeking and offend you and harm others. I don't like it. It's not fair. I should be able to just enjoy my own desires, whatever they may be, right? So you need that kind of deep intimacy with God where you can be honest with him and you're not trying to be like, no, I'm not really like that. And you try to cover it up. You try to talk to God as if you're not really how, who, how you are on the inside. Like he knows your thoughts. He knows your feelings. And then you come talk to him as if he has no idea. And this shows that a lot of people, even Christians, don't truly believe God. They don't truly believe in him. Because if they truly believed him, they would know he knows the truth. They can't BS him. So you just got to be open and honest. You see, when you do that, you let God in. And then he starts changing you from the inside out. And, uh, to wrap this up, there was a parable. I believe it was in Matthew. Uh, I don't remember where it is, so I'm going to put in here, he desired me. It's about the, the servant. And I think it's perfect for this, showing that God uh, he has feelings, and you can hurt his feelings. Right? Because he cares for you, he loves you, and if you're if you flip him off, it's not like, oh, how dare you flip off God? It's like how why would you flip off somebody that cares for you and loves you and wants the best for you and you just disrespect them like that? Right? Again, like if your child did that to you, and this isn't coming up. So I have to put in a different phrase here. Uh, so let me think. Uh, it's the parable of the servant that was forgiven. He was forgiven like 10,000 talents. And then he gets upset about the servant who owes him 100 pennies or something like that. But let me think real quick. Uh, maybe if I put that in 10,000. I think it was in Matthew, 10,000, was it shekels? I don't think that's what it was. 10,000, oh, that's what I'm going to put. Oh, man. I have to put this in, and I don't want to cut the video, so you might have to sit here while I think about it. Um, dang. Dang. Can't think of a phrase to put in there. Uh, have mercy on me. On me, I will repay all that I owe. Might have to just use my King James church. There we go. Matthew eighteen sixteen. I believe this is it. So let's do that. Thanks for your patience. I think this is a good way to end this video. Um, no, this is not it. Down here, the unforgiving unforg servant. There we go. Did I misread that? 26. Yeah, I said 16. Okay, my bad. All right. Uh, so... I'm just going to read some parts of this. Of course, you can read the whole thing. But it starts off saying, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven like unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, 
One was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his, his and children, and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will repay thee. I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. So you see that the Lord had some compassion on him. So you see, he feels things for us, right? You see, he doesn't show forgiveness. You can read on with that, but I want to cut down to uh, where... Uh, I'll I'll tell you when I get to it. <laughs> ah, right here, starting at verse 32. It says, Then his Lord, after that he called him, said unto him, O wicked servant. Now this is, he forgave him, and then he wouldn't forgive somebody else, right? He says, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. And that right there really caught my eye. Like I've read that so many times and just kind of overlooked that. But you see, the Lord was like, hey, you desire me. You want to get to know me. But kind of like what you talked about David, where he's like a man after my own heart. Right? He, he wants us to have that kind of relationship with him because he desires that about us. But we just seem to be like, whatever. Whatever about God and He's just there to, if we need him for something. And then we beg him, like, help us out with this. Why is all these things happening to me? It's like, what? You believe God is God, and he's all-knowing and all-powerful. He's everywhere. And he takes the time to be with you, and you believe he's with you all the time, but you don't pay attention to him. Unless you need something or want something. We're made like him. We have these feelings and stuff so we can understand him. Not because we have feelings and he doesn't. Because we have thoughts and he doesn't. Because we have desires and he doesn't. We have these things so that we can understand and know him. kind of deep right make you think about how you you treat the lord how close are you to him because uh there's one other thing i wanted to you know it's in matthew so i'll stay over here it came to mind not chapter seven chapter six you see this same thing here you know how the people came following Jesus, wanting him, wanting his word. And what did Jesus do? He fed them, right? But when the people came to him looking for bread, looking to be fed, he didn't feed them anything. He gave them his word instead, right? Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 33, I suggest you read that. It's talking about having faith. You know, God knows what you need, right? But he's saying, don't take thought for your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, you know, where you're going to lay your head, you're going to have a roof over you or anything like that, right? He's saying, go by faith, right? And then he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And that is exactly what happened with those people who were fed. They came to, to Jesus for Jesus, for his word. That's what they wanted. And he's like, they desire me. I'm going to take care of these people. He takes care of them and feeds them. That's what he does for us. That's what he does for me. 
I don't really even have to think about it and worry about it. I don't recall the last time I had to pray uh, because I didn't have what I needed. Now, as I pray for things I want, usually my family and friends saved, but other things, um, he supplied it. And I, I know from experience that my mindset was going to God. I want God. I want the truth. He is the truth. I want the whole thing. And since I come after him, everything just falls into place and you just don't have to worry about it. He just takes care of you. Right? You can trust him. And uh, try not to break down a bit here, but he's good. He's great. I wish you could know him the way I know him if you don't. So you, you, you come looking to him as if he's a, a soup kitchen or an ATM, a genie. Well, don't expect to get anything from him. Because God wants you, he desires you, and he wants you to desire him in that same way. When you don't, you should know how that feels. We all experience that. Whether there's somebody, whether growing up there's a friend you really liked and he didn't want to hang out with you anymore or she didn't want to hang out with you anymore. And when you got older, you liked a certain gal or guy and they didn't like you back, right? It's not that you necessarily hate them, but it hurts, right? So you got to realize that God feels that same thing with billions of people that constantly reject him. It's kind of heavy, right? So, with all that said, thanks for watching. Take care. All right, here's the three verses that I like to put in all the videos here. Isaiah 34, 16, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read so that Jesus doesn't tell you what he tells the Sadducees here in Matthew 22, 29. Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures. It's not that you err in error because you don't know the, the one true church that happens to be your denomination or that you don't know your, the, the fundamental beliefs or the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed or whatever creed, or that you don't know the magisterium or the clergy or you don't know your favorite pastor or priest, that's why you're an error. No, you're an error because you don't know the scriptures. You need the scriptures to test to see whether or not those are correct, whether those are the right traditions, whether those are legitimate clergy, whether that church is actually following God, and whether those creeds line up. Those fundamental beliefs are found in the scriptures because... Knowing the scriptures is knowing God. Like we read here in John 17, 3, Jesus says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And this is a deep knowing, as Adam knew Eve, and she conceived. You need to know God in like manner, so that you may be born again, that his word, his seed, abides in your heart. Will you truly believe that Jesus Christ it's God in the flesh that he died in your place and gives you his life in exchange so that your righteousness, your good and your bad, your life, past, present, and future, died 2,000 years ago. Your life is his. He can do what he wants with it. He puts it to death, and he gives you his life in exchange, his perfect, eternal life. That's the deep knowing you need to know of God. So... There you go. Do you know him? Do you want to know him? You get to know him. Thanks again for watching. Take care. That fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. 
he couldn't get baptized, he couldn't get baptized, he woke up with God, he woke up with the devil. Are you saved? So a fella didn't take the sacraments, didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary, didn't take the rosary. Didn't tie, didn't tie. He went to heaven, he went to hell. You say? Didn't keep the law, he didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments, he broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule, he didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory, he woke up in the pit. Are you saved? You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. Amen. It's like that. <laughs> you have been saved? Yeah. If you ever saved, you were saved like that. Amen. 